On today's World Insight, as part of our Discovery Confucius Special, a deep dive into Confucian influence on the humanities with Peking University Humanities Chair, Professor Roger Ames. All of the problems that the human being is facing today can only be resolved through collaboration by people working together. A towering ancient figure, a legendary sage, and a source of inspiration. As part of the enduring Chinese civilization, more than 2,500 years after Confucius was born, they accept my invitation to go back in history. Discuss his ideas and why he is particularly relevant today. Discovering Confucius. Hello and welcome to Discovering Confucius, a World Insight Special with me, Tian Wei. For more than two millennia, Confucian thought has had a major impact on Chinese society and governance. It has also been a steady fountain of a people spirit and personal conduct. But it's still a long way to go from knowing the significance to applying it to cross-cultural communications and even to tap into it for inspirations and solutions to challenges today. Roger Ames, the Humanities Chair Professor at Peking University and Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at University of Hawaii, has been working on that while translating some of the most challenging key works from ancient China. When I talked to him recently, he told me there is an urgency in translating the Chinese classics not as if they were written based on Western cultural values, but rather respect them as they uniquely are and try to explain them with layers of meanings as they have in Chinese. Here's our conversation. When China is dealing with so much in today's world, how relevant still is Confucius and Confucianism. Uh, China has an important contribution to make to the world today. I think we want to think of China as Da Tang, as the great Tang Dynasty. That the Tang Dynasty was, uh, Chang'an was the center of the world where foreign foreigners would come to the court and, and, and so on. That, uh, China was very cosmopolitan, um, and that's the direction that China is is taking today. That China is really engaging the world, and it has a very important contribution to make. the The Confucian tradition, with its emphasis upon ecological thinking, upon interdependence, upon trying to get the most out of the circumstances. Um, is something that is necessary to address the pressing issues of the time. We, we have global warming, pandemic, uh, environmental degradation, food and water shortage, proxy wars, international terror. All of, the, all of the problems that the human being is facing today can only be resolved through collaboration by people working together, uh, by uh, by uh, countries working together. And so my reading of Confucianism is that it has a very important uh, contribution to make as an alternative to the ideology of individualism. Individual people, individual states, um, that's not real. We're not individuals. Everything we do is in association with other people. Uh, everything that that um, nation states do is really um, it's it's an ecology, a political and social ecology, and so we have to we have to recognize it as such. Do you see it's a debate about soft power, or about you know what is the best practices that we could have uh, with ourselves, human being, with our society, and with nature? 
What do you make of the nature of this debate uh, in the world today? Um, I think that soft power is the only way that um, uh, we have to avoid conflict at all costs, that, that um, the conflicts don't serve anybody's interest, um, that um, we have to be more intelligent than uh, descending into uh, confrontations. And so um, soft power is culture. Um, what we need is we need civilization. People have to act in a civilized way. And I think that that is, again, um, the tradition of, the, of Confucianism is the civilizing, civilizing of the human experience, the, the notion of Li. Uh, you know, we talk about Ti Hua, but we also want to talk about Li Hua as a process of civiliz civilizing the human experience. In a world that is dominated by liberal values, China rose economically and politically, and it startled the world. And so the, when you're startled by something you don't understand, you're afraid of it. And so the, the, the idea of educating the world on China is something that we have to do. And it, 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 but we have to do it properly, you know? We have to, to, to transmit uh, the, a term like li, you know, at the end, it means ritual, but li is so much more. Li is a social grammar. Li has to do with ancestors, and it has to do with the intergenerational transmission of, of, of a living cultural tradition. It has to do with elegance. It has to do with lifting the human being out of our animality and making us into something that is refined and noble. Um, and so to, to communicate these ideas um, effectively really requires that the world be educated on this Confucian tradition. The Chinese are also trying to discover what's actually behind the traditions. They also are having a rediscovering process right now. What do you make of this process so far? How sophisticated is this process at this moment? The Confucianism that is out there in the world is not the real Confucianism. It is a Confucianism that was introduced into the Western Academy by missionaries where they translate a term like Tian as heaven with a capital H. They translate a word like Tao as the way. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and, the, and, and I am the way, the truth, and life. You know, that, um, um, that uh, Confucian philosophy in the libraries in the West is not shelved in the philosophy section is shelved in the religion section because Confucianism was converted into a kind of Christianity. And so what we need is we need the, 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 the most sophisticated understanding of Confucianism by Chinese leading intellectuals to be communicated to the West. Professor Ames, a lot of people that I met today in Shifu have been comparing, you know, what is Confucius thinking about and Confucianism vis-a-vis -vis the Western liberalism uh, started from Renaissance. That what we have to do is we have to understand first our own assumptions, our own uh, purposes in trying to understand the other, while at the same time trying to penetrate into the ways in which the other is different from us. And so understanding emerges in the middle between trying to understand your own assumptions and trying to understand what is different in the other culture. So this kind of comparative cultural hermeneutics really sets up a distinction. I'll give you just give you one example. Classical Greek, uh, the, the notion of the individual, goes back to Pythagoras. Um, it goes, it's Aristotle, it's Plato. Um, but in the Chinese tradition, you don't have a human being. Uh, you don't have something that is that is individual, that is separate, that is discrete, that is autonomous. What you have is you have a human becoming. That in the Confucian world, people become who they are 
by cultivating their relationships with other people. And the, the stronger the cultivation, the stronger the relationships, the more distinctive a person becomes. And so individual in classical Greek, Greece is where you start. Individual in the Confucian tradition is what you attain. Meanwhile, you've been writing academic papers on is uh, comparing Confucianism and also American pragmatism. Uh, some would say this is, uh, you know, hundreds of miles apart, but why is that comparison relevant, Professor? That, that pragmatism is very simple. Pragmatism means practice. That, that when, when you, a tradition is jirxing he yi, you know, the inseparability of knowing and doing, what that means is that the starting place for theorizing is practice itself that you theorize practice in order to try to make it more intelligent, to make it more um, productive, to try to make it, um, to add, add meaning to it. And so the, the Confucian tradition is, is a distinctively Confucian kind of pragmatism. There is so much resonance between uh, Confucianism and, and pragmatism that what it does is it provides us with a common vocabulary. We want to de-exoticize Confucianism to understand each other. Uh, the the um, the the uh, Dewey, John Dewey's concept of person is very much like Ren. It's it, it's you know with the idea of relational person. Uh, John Dewey's concept of um, of religiousness is human centered religiousness, family centered religiousness. There's no God, you know, and so much in 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 pragmatism is resonant with the Confucian tradition, that if we can put Confucian voices together with, with world pragmatism voices, then China can be better understood. What you're talking about is mainly at an academic circle. What about for the common folks to understand better about Confucius and Confucianism, both in this country and beyond? Young Chinese are coming back to their own culture, that there's this renewed confidence in the in the tradition and it's been promoted by certainly by the academic world it's also being promoted by government the the the, the difference between um abstract western philosophy like kant or hegel and confucian philosophy is that confucian philosophy is living philosophy that um i interviewed um, uh, famous uh, Chinese scholars like Guo Qiyong. And I asked Guo Qiyong, you know, you're this very famous scholar in China and you're, you're seen as an expert on Confucianism. He said, oh, no, no. He said, I learned everything about Confucianism at the knee of my uneducated grandmother. That, that, that philosophy in China belongs to the people. Philosophy is a way of life. It's not um, some kind of abstract, uh, technical uh, way of thinking about the human experience. A grandmother's love for her grandson is the most common thing in the world, and it's the most wonderful thing in the world. A towering ancient figure, a legendary sage, and a source of inspiration. As part of the enduring Chinese civilization. More than 2,500 years after Confucius was born, they accept my invitation to go back in history, discuss his ideas, and why he is particularly relevant today. Discovering Confucius. Uh, there is a tradition in China to look into the history to find the inspirations and lessons for the future. Uh, how much do you see this process is going on in China? Uh, so far, is it convincing to you? It's the, really the story of Chinese philosophy. On the one hand, um, China is certainly uh, mining its long cultural tradition, but China is also at the... Uh, on the, on the front lines of the development of artificial intelligence, of the development of new technologies, and, and, and so on. And this, this is not 
these are not two separate things. This is one thing. If we look at the book of changes, the Yi Jing, the Yi Jing is all about how Fu Shi and Shen Nong and so on produce different kinds of technologies in order for the human being to live in the world in a more effective way, to, be, to lift the human being out of the crudeness of the human experience and aestheticize it, make it into something beautiful. And so what we're doing in terms of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is really natural intelligence because the human being is part of nature, tian ren he yi, you know, that uh, human being is not something separate, human being is integral to um, nature. And so as long as the technologies align with a kind of cosmic morality, then, um, uh, then the technologies serve the human experience. If they offend against uh, the cosmic morality, like war and, and um, machines for hurting people and so on, uh, then, then, then these are bad technologies. So, so we don't want to talk about artificial intelligence. What we want to talk about is we want to talk about real intelligence, natural intelligence, and unnatural intelligence. How do you see this... Uh... Uh, the success of this uh, process, is it still with us today in China uh, from your living experience? Uh, absolutely. I think um, like we, we translate, we, again, we simplify the Confucian tradition. We translate a term like he as harmony. He doesn't mean harmony. He means an, an optimizing symbiosis. It means yo hua gong xiang ti xi that what it means is getting the most out of your ingredients. When you look at a Chinese menu, um, what the difference between a Chinese menu and a, a European menu is a European menu is two pages. A Chinese menu in a Chongqing restaurant is a book. The, 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 the menu in the, in the Guangdong restaurant next door is another book. That, that this idea of getting the most out of your ingredients, he, um, optimizing uh, what you can get from your ingredients is a very powerful value in the uh, Confucian tradition, and I think it goes on today. But on the other hand, many could argue, where would you spend your energy? Is it mainly on rituals? Uh, of course, this is not necessarily uh, equals to what Confucius referred to as uh, li yi, or is it going to be more concentrating on the real essence. So how do you see the formality vis-a-vis uh, -vis the essence? I, I, don't, I don't see Li as being ritual in a formal sense. The, the word ritual in the English language is almost negative, almost pejorative, because it separates the form from the content. But, but, but Li is really concentrating on your relationships and your family. Li is um, is carrying on a tradition uh, that you embody, that you've learned from your your grandparents. That when you look at your grandmother's face, you see a similarity with your own face. But when you look at your life, the the values, the food, the the language, the the aesthetic sensibility, the the religious sensibilities are all being embodied from generation to generation. And so I think that the, the notion of Li is all about substance, not about formality. It's, it's a combination of the formal and the informal, where you need the formal as a way of refining. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the real substance of Li is, is feeling. That, 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 um, that Li without Ren uh, isn't Li. You know, that's the point. Mm. Professor, how do you see the fact that Confucius and Confucianism was not necessarily the most popular theory when the state of Qin eventually united China and became the Qin dynasty? In fact, uh, Confucius was not necessarily popular, uh, particularly at the end of his life. Uh, it is not a theory that managed to unite China. Only later, when China was united, emperors and administrators of dynasties realized this is a theory that they could apply and make sure that the country could develop in unity. So um, this really is very interesting to study the context of uh, Confucius and Confucianism. And therefore, what does that tell us about the nature of this theory? 
It, it, it tells us that we have to stop understanding China uh, according to Western concepts. The, the idea of Confucianism was introduced into the Western language in the middle of the 19th century by the second governor of Hong Kong. If we speak Chinese, we don't say Kong Si Chu Yi, we say Ru Xue. Ru is not a one person. Ru is 30 generations before Confucius in the Shang Dynasty, where a, a, a class of people responsible for transmitting the cultural tradition arose and the process of aestheticizing, of civilizing the human experience began. And so Confucius is one voice in this long tradition, a very important voice, but one voice within this tradition. What we know about the Qin dynasty that was based upon Fa Jia kind of, of thinking is that it lasted only for a couple of decades. And then it fell, and within the Han Dynasty, with Dong Zhong Shu and all of these other, um, with these other Confucian philosophers, uh, that Confucianism became the state ideology. Mm. I love that explanation. But on the other hand, uh, we are living in a world that is still made of nation states. Uh, also, uh, the so-called globalization, which has been uh, shattered uh, to a certain extent. So when we are looking at the realities of the world, how much will Confucius and Confucianism uh, be of help? Uh, meanwhile, it has to be, will that be the case that Confucianism only accepted by all will work? However, if only one country or one people subscribe to it, it might not necessarily serve that one country and one people, not to mention the rest of the world. How should we understand you know, the extent of which it can be applied and its function eventually. Yeah. The, the, the conference, the, the concept of the nation state was forced upon China by imperial powers. That, that China is Tianxia, that China never saw itself as being one uh, bordered state among other states. When you think of the population of China, China is almost twice the combined population of Eastern and Western Europe. China is the population of Africa with all of the diversity that Africa has. So, so China, India, Russia, in some ways, these are alternative ways of thinking about the, 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 the world where the Westphalian concept of the nation state that prevails today has proved woefully inadequate in responding to uh, the kind of problems that human beings are facing. So what we need is we need to, to move to an alternative way of thinking. Your, your idea that what we need is we need to find a minimalist morality. And I think that the Confucian tradition's notion of qin qin, China, China, the Confucian notion of xiao is something that, that Confucianism doesn't have to persuade Italians or Ugandans of chin chin. Everybody feels chin chin. And so um, the Confucian tradition can be a, should be a model for other people to look at their own tradition. What, what kept China together for 4,000 years? It's the xiao dao. It's the intergenerational transmission of a living cultural tradition. When you look at Greece, when you look at Italy, when you look at Egypt, when you look at Iran, they don't have that kind of thick continuity that China has because the Chinese tradition, the notion of xiao, makes each generation responsible for embodying and transmitting the tradition. Mm. Professor Ames, you see this uh, debate that is going on within one individual about what is the best uh, time to apply uh, the so-called traditions of China and to apply uh, what they have learned about the Western practices, which apparently seem to function in the modern world better, by the way. The modernity is also a Western concept. Um, how do you see this uh, daily debate, hourly debate in one individual and in the society and in the world today? Well, what, uh, the way that I see it is that the fact that uh, the Confucian tradition keeps on um, the first, the first Xi Xue, the first Western learning that comes into China is Buddhism. 
then after that it's um it's it's Matteo Ricci and and um European culture and then it's Protestant missionaries and then it's Marxism that the, the strength of the Confucian tradition has always been this openness to 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 draw into itself and and digest and make as part of its own tradition those things that come from outside the real the real problem that we have today is that china is is continuing to to uh, evolve as a, as as a hybridic civilization whereas western powers are are self-contained they're not interested china doesn't impact do do Western people know as much about China as China knows about the West? And the answer is absolutely not. You know that that China is a mystery for most Europeans and Americans and so on. Um, for for most Chinese, uh, the Western tradition is something that is is quite familiar because they have brought it into their own tradition. These worlds have a lot to learn from each other. Um, she, in a, a she feng hua to westernize is not a bad thing. You need to um, to to use all of your resources in order to find the best way forward. Uh, how do you see the study of Confucius and Confucianism evolving over the years as we are facing a ever more complex world? What I what I've published recently is two books and the 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 cover of the book for me is very important what it is is it's a it's a tree in the songyang shuyuan in henan and this tree is 4500 years old that that this tree represents the tradition of what i call uh sheng sheng lun that when we look at Bunti Lun, ontology in the Greek tradition, it's all about an existing reality, about knowing an existing reality. The Chinese tradition is all about Shang Shang. It's all about Shang Shang Zhu Wei Yi. It's all about Tian Di Zhu Da De Yue Shang. You know, the, the greatest um, capacity of the cosmos is life itself. And so um, what I've done is I've I've prepared a conceptual lexicon of, for the Confucian tradition, and I've also prepared a source book of, for classical Confucianism. And it's been published in China by Shangwu Yinshu Guan, but it's been published in America too by the State University of New York Press. What is the purpose? Is to educate the world on the real Confucianism. Professor Ames, such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. And this is Discovering Confucius, a special interview series on the great Chinese sage. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insights or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.